So I'm Sam. And I'm Jim. And you are listening to Sonic Perspectives. Hello and welcome to another interview with Sonic Perspectives. Today I am joined by two of the lovely gentlemen from none other than Caligula's Horse. I'm really excited to talk about the tour that you have going on right now and your recently released album, Charcoal Grace. So you've landed in the U.S. How has it been? How has the first night of the tour? Cold. <laughs> Um, we've just come from Australian summer and it's a particularly hot one uh, and jumping straight into DC with the temperature that it's been has been pretty cold. Outside of that, terrific. We, we've had a little tourist time and then we played a show and the, the reception we had for our first headline show in the United States was beautiful. So mm. it, was, it was a really lovely time. It's been a long time coming for us but it feels like that sentiment was very much shared. It's mm. lovely. Absolutely. Because I was going to say, if I had my hemispheres right, you'll be getting two winters this year. Yeah, but I mean, you say winter, like we live in Queensland, like the worst it gets is just, you got to put a, a jumper on. You don't, <laughs> you, you don't have to, you don't have to put a jumper on. We do though. <laughs> well, you gentlemen haven't seen nothing yet. You have Chicago and Michigan ahead of you, so. Montreal is the one everyone's like saying, watch out. <laughs> so we're ready. We've prepared as we can be, little Aussies that we are. <laughs> Absolutely. And you mentioned that you got some tours in that. I know that's really hard for bands on the road. What have you seen so far? Well, we were fortunate that we got into we got into DC like a, a day early. So we kind of had a production day and stuff. And we managed to squeeze out as a result, um, just a trip around all of the monuments and, and, and all of that stuff, which is wonderful. Like, don't get me wrong. It's not like we had like a whole day. We had like a couple of hours to <laughs> run between places, yeah. but still we'll do whatever we can just to see the sights. It's Sightseeing like... at a sprint is, is what it is. <laughs> yeah. And where are you guys playing tonight? So tonight we're in Philly. Um, again, like I state the obvious first time, but um, wonderful venue. What's this place called? I totally forget. I think because it's the Underground um, Arts. The it's Underground Arts, Arts. that's yeah. right. Um, Philly today, and then we're off to Boston tomorrow, don't we? Uh, yeah, sure. I don't know. We're, <laughs> we're, we're both catching up. I hope it's Boston tomorrow. I'll make a fool of myself. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, I don't want to press on a bruise here, but this is long overdue. This was supposed to happen a solid three years ago now. So what are your feelings, I guess, just finally making this happen and not really with Rise Radiant. It's with Charcoal Grace now. Mm. Well, because the thing is, we, we obviously had, you know, so many best laid plans around the Rise Radiant era. And like basically everything that sort of acted as the background for the new album for Charcoal Grace kind of folds into the disappointment that we felt on that you know we cancelled an American tour but we also cancelled you know a, a solid year of touring plans around that and just the experience of getting to know an album on the back of all that you know mm. so you know to say it was a disappointment is um, almost an understatement I suppose but now that we're finally here and like I said before we're hearing from everyone that that's something that it, it's sort of echoed in the way they're describing their experience it's just wonderful it's like we can all kind of celebrate and have this this catharsis at the the end of all of that together you know absolutely and you've mentioned in press and previous interviews that charcoal grace to you is really stepping out of that rise radiant era what does that mean for you what is new in the music what have you really evolved in your skills i think one of the things that we were really deliberate about with rise radiant is that we wanted to be kind of exciting punchy concise energetic kind of material um, and this time you know given the subject matter and where we were at um, when we started, like mentally, when we started writing Charcoal Grace, is that it's a lot more exploratory and um, through composed and expansive, and, and it's sort of adventurous in that way. And it's definitely a lot darker as well. It's not; it's much darker in its tone, lyrically and musically, than we've ever really touched on before. Um, so it's yeah, it's, it is a bit of a contrast from uh, from Rise Radiant, but sort of the hope that we have is that even though it is dark, that it is, as you said before, kind of a cathartic thing that people can take a positive. Uh, uh, response to at the ultimately at the end of the album yeah it's a response to something we all felt mm. after all even if you know we're, we're articulating it through our own little musical voice and with that exploratory sense i've noticed that as a fan you've really moved to these long form songs on this album there's a 10 minute song a 12 minute song and then of course the titular suite which runs almost 25 minutes long what is different for you about writing these longer songs 
Well, writing longer pieces of music has always been kind of a side focus. You know, we usually have like one or two sort of longer songs, but Jim kind of um, touched on it in his previous answer. We gave ourselves the ability, like we gave ourselves the freedom to explore longer spaces, especially spaces where things aren't necessarily sort of claustrophobically happening. In other words, just allowing ourselves to be immersed in space in its own right. So that is one element that I think really defines a good longer song. You need to have, you know, some degree of um, kind of uh, reprieve from the action. You need to have ebbs and flows that make sense when you're listening to them. But the other thing, um, and this is something that's a bit of a thread through a lot of our writing, is um, we want to have motivic connection. So, you know, if there's an idea that is introduced in minute one of a 24 minute suite, there better be some payoff of that idea later. It's almost like a musical Chekhov's gun, right? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> like, by act three, you've got to use it. Exactly, yeah. right. So, you know, when we're writing these longer pieces of music, um, we we have this this... We have this sense, and it's very instinctive at this point, although it was a little bit more deliberate earlier on in our career when we were still working on these skills, the sense that like if we're going to introduce four motifs in the first few minutes of a song, there's no getting away from it being a longer song because we can't just, they, they need space to develop, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, the Chuckle Grace Suite is a great example, just because um, I remember writing Prey, and I remember saying to you, look, we've got like four or five really solid ideas mm -hmm. that are moving between one another. To try and resolve that in a single shorter song would just be Yeah, this is going a somewhere. Waste. Yeah. I always feel like, you know, for me, that it's never really an intent to go like, hey, we're going to go write a long song now. Uh, it's never really like that. It's very much more like, what the song needs to say and what the song wants to say and where we feel that going mm. and kind of expanding on that until we feel it's come to a, a you know conclusion. Um, so it's never really a deliberate thing. And in this case, it was, again, reflective of just where we were at. I was telling actually the fans in the meet and greet, like for a funny piece of trivia, um, the song Mute, which is 12 minutes long, was originally uh, envisioned to be a maybe two minute intro track to the world breathes with me yeah. so you can see you know we start working on stuff and it sort of gives us a direction we do sometimes say this is going to be longer early on but it's usually because the material suggests it i think absolutely and to tie back to the suite that is a mammoth endeavor four songs and even in the world of prog metal to put a suite in the middle of an album is really ambitious what really inspired you to go that route yeah, that's a really good question. No one's actually talked about the sequencing yet. Because no, because yeah. the things we obsess over all about, there's yeah. so many hours that go into that. So thanks for asking. I can sort of explain some of it. Um, <clears throat> the one thing to consider with the Charcoal Grey Suite is we actually did know pretty early on, relatively early on, that it was going to be a suite rather than a single song. And that makes a huge difference with sequencing because you've got to consider, like, if you have... Well, maybe in this case, it doesn't matter so much for the vinyl because it's a vinyl side anyway. But like the reason that you often see the longer song put at the end is because it makes much more sense with sequencing. If it's the latter half of the album or something like that, maybe it encapsulates the entirety of the latter half of the album. So when we decided that it was going to be um, a suite and decided also that we were going to try and make it so that each of the four parts was kind of self-contained, um, that, that, by the way, was one of the little driving motivations behind the writing of that song. So this idea that you could listen to A World Without or you could listen to Give Me Hell, you could listen to them individually and they would still be songs. That then makes sense for it to be sequenced, in our case, on a single side of a vinyl. So you get to listen to it as one piece, but you're not forced to do so. You know, you could still enjoy the individual songs as you would any other set of songs on a record or whatever. The other limitation was that, of course, uh, the world breathes with me and mute being so intrinsically connected mm. in that they actually share musical themes and some lyrical themes as well makes for like these really good bookends for the album start and finish as well. So, you know, it would sort of interrupt that a little bit if we were to chuck the suite at the end. We're also kind of contrarians, and it's so common to have the, <laughs> you know, have the big kind of um, side length song, as they say, uh, at the end of the album. So it's kind of fun to do something different. It is really different, and it was so exciting to see that first on the track list and then get to experience that. So thank you for telling me more about it. And when it does come to the vinyl, though, the art and the merchandise tied in with this album is so rich. And I mean, my personal observation is that so many of your prior albums went for these very bright colors and the floral themes and the nature themes, and you've pivoted to this portrait, this darkness. How have you incorporated that and why did you choose that? Yeah, you're very right. Like one thing that we have always 
um, always taken as like a, a, a formative guideline whenever we start working with like the visual aesthetic of an album is that each of our albums is very, very different looking, like a different art style, a different artist, etc. But you are right that the common thread is that for the most part, we try and shy away from kind of traditional metal imagery. You know, there's not as many kind of black and blue and, 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 and dark colors and whatnot. Um, but I mean, the reason why we went that direction in this album is probably thematically fairly evident. What we struggled with was trying to translate this incredibly, well, first of all, like practically felt experience, but then one that we've abstracted so intensely in the lyrics. Like it's very rarely something that you just say what something is about. Mm -hmm. So how do we sort of translate that to the record? Um, and I, I came across Chris Panettiere's artwork, the guy who did it. Um, he's actually better known for some of the stuff you might see on our merchandise, which is like wonderful line work with kind of more watercolor type colors. Um, incredible incredible artist and i found in his archive like i trawled back through because i really liked his stuff i found he had done some oil paintings early on so i messaged him I'm like so you know that stuff you're famous for can i get you to do something totally different <laughs> um <laughs> we started working on it. what's really funny is that he, he did some photo manipulations and stuff just to like test ideas out and i remember him sending us some of his kind of proof of concepts and we were just like yeah that's it yeah <laughs> like also, it was so how cool. did you stumble on this so quickly but you know one final thing just to add to that um having chris do an oil painting was actually something that meant something to us as well because right now there's this controversy around like a lot of AI art and album covers and things mm -hmm. and we really wanted given the nature of the album given the nature of our approach to music we deliberately wanted something that looked like it had a like a physical hand involved in it you know like it looks quite kind of boutique and uh, I guess artisan in that way like you know we wanted someone else's personality on it and Chris definitely gave us that. Mm -hmm. And it's fantastic to understand just how involved that was to have a real oil painting. I mean, that's just so special. It's gorgeous. Absolutely. And when it comes to the band, um, another big change in the last couple of years is that you did move from a quintet to a quartet. So how has that impacted your songwriting and your creative process, if at all? What's interesting is that basically from the beginning of the band onwards, um, you know, we, we have had a number of different lineup changes, but it's the core songwriting has always come from Sam and myself, um, mostly Sam. Um, so, the, <laughs> and so that was kind of the core songwriting team. And so um, Adrian leaving was sort of like, it was one of those things where we couldn't be sad about it because Adrian was sort of on his own path and wanted to pursue his own stuff. And so we were happy for him to go and do that. You know, if he wasn't content with just touring and being in the band, then of course we want, we want the best for him. Um, but ultimately it didn't really change the approach to how we make music other than how we translate it live. Mm. That's really the only difference. And one of the main ways is uh, our bassist Dale just has to take a much greater responsibility with filling that tone out, Dale. He just yeah. opened the door <laughs> with, <laughs> with filling his tone out and stuff like that. Cause you know, obviously it does mean that we have one fewer instrument um, to be able to be arranged in the live context. But I, I, I mean, honestly, it's felt quite liberating as well. Mm. You gotta understand like there is a, a very, um, significant practical limitation to being a touring band. Like everybody in the tour costs thousands of dollars more. And all I would say stuff. doubly so as an Australian touring band. As an Australian band. touring band. And it's just wonderful kind of having this tight little unit of like minds, you know, mm. it's, um, it's been cool. That's really great to hear. And I'm going to pivot right back around to that live discussion because you are on tour right now. What songs from the album are you just most excited to put out there on the live stage? Mute. <laughs> yeah, Mute, Mute to my favorite song on the album, and it, 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 not by any choice. It was one of those ones where we just finished. It. I was just like, I, I just, I like this. I like all of my children, but this one is my this favorite. This one is my favorite. Um, <laughs> no, but Mute is the answer. But the, the truth is, like all of them that we are playing on this tour, and I don't want to be too spoilery, I suppose. Um, but all of them that we're playing are just incredible because they do have this sense of capturing these past few years, and it's sort of this amazing cathartic experience to play them. It's almost an exorcism in the same way this yeah. album was meant to be. We're getting rid of all of that baggage and stuff. And even doing. just last night at that first show in DC, like it was uh, amazing to see just all the, there's a lot, of, a lot of tears in the crowd that night, like a lot, a lot of tears. Um, and I think it's just showing that those songs, songs particularly like, uh, like Mute in particular, like 
really have connected with people and their stories and stuff like that. So it's really nice to see that reflected in the live context. I've had the privilege to see you guys um, twice now. And I will say, I don't think I've ever seen a band that has many people crying as you guys. I am, I'm serious. <laughs> yeah, it's become one of those things. Because of course, like we, we, we love it in a sense because it just demonstrates how, how kind of emotionally um, impactful it is. But at the same time, you know, I make eye contact with a fan who's crying and just like, it, it, no. it's, it's, it's hard. And it's probably, as a, as a vocalist who is also a sympathetic crier, it's really challenging. Because if I look down at somebody who's weeping, particularly if it's like, third row massive dude with a huge beard and metal shirt just silently crying it like it upsets the heck out of me because then i start choking i'm, like, eh, and I'm trying to hold it together so it's particularly difficult yeah the we are we part. asked for this yeah we, we knew what this was and when it comes to either just instrumental skills or vocal skills and vocal range is there a song that's particularly difficult to perform live or just extra demanding me <laughs> <laughs> no, for, for me, for me, it's uh, the world breathes with me, which yeah, is just much it's I, I don't know why I, I packed so many difficult, obscure things into one song, but I'm paying my penance now. Mm. That's yeah, that's sure. that's a big thing as well. I will say that a lot of the new album is a really big thing. And like, I think in a lot of ways, you know, we really went for it on the mm. album because there was a lot of kind of energy that went into it. Like, again, this catharsis and stuff. I was very angry for a very long time. Still am a little bit. And like performances on stuff like the storm chaser is a, is a huge thing because of everything that I had to put into it. And so mm. I'm actually having to learn now how to sort of articulate that live in a way that's safer to sing than I did on the record because of how much I had to give, you know, for that. So I think in a way, we're just sort of still finding our feet with these songs really mm. and seeing where, Getting to where it takes them. us. Totally. Yeah, that power I'm sure is hard to translate. I mean, even in the music video, it was palpable. It was so visceral. So I'm really glad to hear that you're doing it safely, of course. <laughs> oh, I, I kind of. I'm doing my best. <laughs> as long as he's got a break after this tour to, so, you fun. know, rebuild. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the plan after this tour? What are you looking to do? Recover? Or are you already itching to get back into songwriting again? Well, a, a little bit of both. I mean, we've obviously got a pretty busy year ahead of us. You know, we're, we're sort of now talking in terms of world tour as we've sort of added Europe and added Australia and added the UK and all of these other dates. Um, but the truth is that, um, and this is gonna be a much longer answer than I think you may have intended that, but <laughs> the, the truth is like Charcoal Grace took a lot of time to write because we had to rediscover ourselves in that pandemic period. But now we're feeling really good and really tight and really coherent. And we, I, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm definitely happy to start writing pretty soon. And it'll just be a matter of being able to sit down and get it, get it going. Yeah, yeah it's, it's funny. Being back into touring has essentially made me want to just fucking punch the sun with some, with some music. I just want to do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, this is the thing that we were fighting to try and feel during the pandemic, but right now it's 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 back, it's here. So oh, I, oh. I guess the short answer I could have given you is, yeah, we're going to start writing as soon as we can. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are absolutely packed to the gills. You've got these interviews that you're doing. Tomorrow you are doing um, a live Q&A on Reddit. You're- I'm glad so you were you? <laughs> yeah. you guys are definitely keeping busy um and in the spirit of that i will keep it short and sweet because you guys have a long night ahead of you so um are there any last things you want to say about charcoal grace about the tour the, the food you're most looking forward to eat in america <laughs> anything no look we, we are so profoundly excited to finally be in america after all this time oh, yeah. The catharsis that we're getting to feel through Charcoal Grace, we cannot wait for people to come and feel with us. Mm. And we can't wait to see your faces on the road. I can't wait to see you guys on the road. <laughs> Thank you for listening to another interview with Sonic Perspectives. You just heard an interview with a good half of Caligula's Horse. Be sure to check out their new album, Charcoal Grace, out now and catch them on tour in the next two months. Thank you, gentlemen, so much. And please take care and enjoy the enjoy the ride. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Take See ya. care. Yeah. Bye now.